Hello, Watch Enthusiasts. Now, a few months ago now, I was emailed with regards to why a lot of modern watches are styled to look like their predecessors or their, uh, their forefathers in horology from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s. And this, I found, was a very, very interesting question, and I'd answered it by email, but I hadn't produced a video on it, and I thought, actually, it might be worthwhile talking about this. Because it's certainly a theme which pops up quite extensively. For example, most of Tudor's uh, current range is based on the concept of the Black Bay, which is, of course, a watch designed to resemble older Tudor watches. And then likewise, this is the case with the new Omega Seamaster 300, which, unlike the 300M, which was very much a modern design when it was originally released in the 90s, is a design which is fundamentally rooted in the 1950s. Now, of course, today's video is very much going to be my opinion on this subject, because there's no definitive answer in terms of uh, an answer to the point of why we enjoy wearing these aged and uh, patinaed watches, which I think a lot of us do enjoy. Um, but in truth, the question behind this is, is somewhat complex, and is based very much on the popularity of vintage watches as a type, rather than necessarily being based entirely upon our preference in modern watches. However, before I begin the video, I would of course like to encourage you all to join the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snups, which is a social media platform where you can share pictures of your collections and interests, and we can discuss matters of horology with myself and indeed other enthusiasts, and ask me any questions or, or, or suggest any video titles that you'd be interested in seeing in future. And so for today's featured picture, we have Thomas Urban's gorgeous Omega Seamaster 300 1957 trilogy model. And of course, these watches were released last year at Baselworld, so pretty much a year to uh, to the present time, and and do show a wonderful recreation of the 1957 models, which is really um, something which ties in extremely well with today's video title, with its aged luminescence and technical specifications, which at first glance appear very dated, yet of course to to a collector are really a wonderful reproduction with modern technology. And in order to join this group, then do feel free to uh, to follow the link down below and uh, and join to be able to enjoy all these additional features. Now, in my eyes, to understand the reason why vintage watches and, indeed, their, their modern re reproductions have become so popular, one does have to look back at the world that the vintage uh, watches came from, because it does seem like it was a world which was very, very different. Because, fundamentally, watches in that era were all we had for timekeeping. Um, of course, there were central clocks that one would set the watch to, but on a daily basis, one would glance down at the wrist in order to tell the time. There was no sort of romanticism to owning a, a, a beautiful timepiece in the same way for the vast majority of people. Hence the fact that there were there were the um, the the, um, the the pin lever movements, which were were pieces, for example, seen in vintage Timexes, which are very very rudimentary movements where you didn't even have a conventional escapement. You had simply two little uh, little pins that were used as the um, um, as the escapement, and so as a result, uh, these watches were the equivalent of a modern quartz. But still, they had that uh, that necessity. A mechanical watch was a necessity, which is something that I think that a lot of us find uh, somewhat alien. But certainly in the world of the luxury segment, the watches that were, that, were, that were collectible in that day were watches like this particular Patek Philippe. Now, this Patek Philippe was owned by Haile Selassie, who was the, uh, the, the emperor of Abyssinia, um, which is, uh, is, is a country which is now modern Ethiopia. And as a result, this watch is a piece which is a vestige of a time. But certainly these golden watches, um, which were very popular in yellow gold, for example, of that era, were the pinnacle of watchmaking as far as showing your wealth with a proper calendar and a moon phase, which were things which were, were simply alien to most people. And so it would certainly be fair to say that in that period, the collectible watches were the luxurious ones. Notably, there were a, a number of, of owners and collectors that were in, in direct correspondence with Patek Philippe, for example, in order to get hold of their, their most, most recent and most interesting serial numbers of, of, of particular models. And this is something which, uh, which today is, is a very rare thing to do with a brand. There seems to be a greater distance between the owner and the brand. And this is seen in the fact that a lot of modern watches um, are, are very much set to be produced under one reference number um, for one style of watch, whereas back then everything was far, far more fluid, um, hence why actually tracking down a vintage watch is so complicated at times. Which is another aspect which is particularly charming about collecting vintage pieces, the fact that actually one has to hunt around for the piece you want. One other factor which I think is crucial to understanding the emergence of the vintage watch as a genuinely collectible item is the fact that watches back uh, back in the middle of the 20th century, and even into the, uh, the late 20th century, were not regarded in their sports forms as luxury goods. For example, these Tudor Submariners that were, were issued to the French, uh, French Navy, for example, are watches which are, to this day, well, these days, utterly battered. And this is because they were designed to be dive watches. They weren't designed to be luxury goods. They were inexpensive at the time. 
um, admittedly within uh, a reason, depending on which brand you went for. But certainly they weren't uh, they weren't enormously expensive uh, luxury goods. They didn't cost um, the the prices, even accounting for inflation. They didn't cost anywhere near what they cost these days. And as a result, these watches have picked up a history. For example, they haven't been simply bought um, from a catalogue and worn. These watches were issued to um, to the naval forces, and then were were used as uh, as timepieces um, in in the in the the middle of uh, of combat. And as a result, these pieces have collected a history and a story to them, which I think as as collectors and as people who simply like the the details of mechanical watches, we tend to 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 crowd around little changes to watches. And as a result, the history of this is something which is irresistible, really, to someone who likes something as delicate and intricate as a watch. I think that this period of watchmaking is also crucial in terms of, of our enjoyment of vintage watches, because this was a period when mechanical watches were parts of, uh, of missions, for example. Notably, for example, uh, the climbing of Mount Everest, um, the marine exploration of Jacques Cousteau, um, and indeed uh, numerous other occasions. And so as a result, I think that uh, the watches of that period somehow have an element of, uh, of charm and mystery in terms of exploration as far as being something very much on the wrist of, uh, um, of explorers and, and of important people. And admittedly, this is quite a, a masculine side of things, um, as there, there are fewer examples of, of female um, and women's watches which have this sort of history, I think, simply due to the nature of those, those times. Um, without uh, without uh, illustrating any particular points um, or being sexist in, in any way, that simply was the the way that things tended to be back then. And so, as a result, these watches have become incorporated and synonymous with that era of discovery. And as is seen from the fact that a lot of uh, military watches, due to their, their their the parts they played in these these um, uh, these great struggles, um, have become iconic and and legendary, and people wear their military watches after the war to commemorate what uh, what happened. And so I think we're seeing a very similar sort of trend in this world of, um, of, of vintage watches. And this is certainly seen with, for example, things like motorsport, hence the, the, the various racing Hoyer chronographs have become so popular because they were seen in that way um, and represented in that way on the, the wrists of people's fav favourite racing drivers. And as a result, people would try and, um, and seek that sort of uh, that, that thrill and enjoyment of, uh, of, of these watches, as was the case back in the day. Of course, the film industry has played a great role in this because it has meant that certain particular references of vintage watches have uh, have been likened to the watches of certain characters. For example, Martin Sheen's uh, Seiko in, um, in in Apocalypse Now, and and like uh, likewise uh, Sean Connery's reference six five three eight seen in um, in in Goldfinger and also in Doctor No are both fil uh, both watches from films which have. Uh, have have left a, an imprint on the memory, and as a result, those collectors who were perhaps children when these films were released are now certainly enjoying being able to own those very watches that uh, that were featured in those those films, which I think is a powerful aspect of of watch purchasing, because in this day and age, watch purchases are not done with with one's head necessarily, because even if one does buy a watch for inv investment purposes, it's very easy to lose a lot of money on a watch if you try and and and, uh, and be clever with regards to buying a vintage timepiece. And so as a result, I think it is very much an emotional connection people have with their watches, just as uh, vintage car collectors would say about their cars. Now I think in the modern uh, world, and indeed the modern world of consuming uh, watches, I think that the, the concept of, of vintage watches as collectible really begins, at least in my eyes, in 1981, when Jean-Claude uh, Biver um, came, in, came into control of Blancpain, which was, of course, the brand which had uh, had taken such an enormous hit and did gone bankrupt during the 1970s. And I know he bought the brand for 22,000 Swiss francs and ended up selling it for 60 million, um, which is uh, an incredible success and an incredible uh, return to form. And this was gra uh, based purely on the, the concept of, of, of taking advantage of the, the length of time the brand had, had been in existence and using that to its advantage. Because in truth, during the the, uh, the 20th century, we remember Blancpain for its diving, um, despite the fact that they produced a lot of a lot of dress watches um, and a lot of uh, of pieces of, of of genuine importance as far as uh, as delicate uh, dress watches go. But certainly, he drew upon the idea that not a single quartz watch had been made, and of course, during that period, the luxury industry had been decimated by the quartz uh, the quartz uh, crisis and the quartz industry. And so this created the seeds, I feel, 
for this idea that uh, luxury and high-end um, is mechanical, and that we should enjoy this craftsmanship, which in many cases wasn't present in the past, and indeed modern watches are much better manufactured than, than, than the ones from the middle of the 20th century. And so the concept of enjoying a vintage watch is very much rooted in the idea of enjoying a watch throughout the entirety of your life, and seeing it uh, become battered over the years from all the, um, the, the, the hard work you've been doing, or indeed um, these days for the amount of door handles you've caught it on. Um, which I think is a more common threat to the average luxury watch than uh, than uh, diving off the the side of a uh, um, a boat in the um, in the Bahamas and finding yourself confronted with a shark and having to fight it off um, is is far less likely an outcome for a dive watch, which I suppose in a way removes from the romanticism of a modern timepiece and hence why we enjoy these vintage watches so much because they represent a um, a certain uh, a certain mystery and a certain uh, wonder which often one doesn't get during daily daily uh, daily life and uh, and daily toil. Of course, advertising plays a very clear role with regards to this story, because of course naturally brands benefit from having good resale value on their watches and indeed uh, uh, great popularity of their vintage timepieces. And so as a result, brands like, for example, Patek Philippe um, have, have throughout the years actually used the idea of, of handing a watch down to the next generation um, in order to, to show the craftsmanship and quality of their watches. And so this really is why actually one, one has that, um, that, that question of, um, uh, of having a watch which lasts a great deal of time and which has seen, seen years of use. And so as a result, I think the vintage watch is a response to that in terms of being able to have a watch which has seen all this time and which is more personal to the individual, because of course these watches are so, um, so, 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 so spread out in terms of their particular references and versions made. However, I think quite crucially, and this is an aspect which I really am curious to hear your opinion on, um, and do feel free to leave your comments and your thoughts in the comments down below, because I really am fascinated to hear, is that the daily life these days is rather complex and... Uh, a lot of our products are things which are very quickly thrown out, um, and even uh, things like computers and mobile phones are, are disposable items, um, despite getting ever higher quality in terms of their build quality um, with each year. And so as a result, um, I think the idea of something which has lasted 50 years is a rather wonderful one, and in the eyes of the consumer at least does justify spending a bit more um, on something which is potentially less well built than a modern, a modern equivalent, simply because it represents something. It represents the ideal that something can last with you um, for a long period of time, which is so abstract compared to what we come across in our daily life. And so as a result, this does provide a sort of a, uh, a grounding for vintage watches to be popular and to be interesting. However, one interesting aspect of the growing industry in the last few years has been the emergence of vintage-inspired watches. And these days it's difficult to name a brand, in fact, that hasn't tried to draw upon its history with some sort of uh, heritage or, uh, or, or retro or vintage remake of something. And this is quite an interesting point, because even very conservative brands like Rolex have had a certain jab at things with, for example, their, um, their use of the, the new single red Sea Dweller um, as a reference to their 1960s original Sea Dweller, which is, again, a very interesting and uncharacteristic aspect. But I think it does show the fact that people do appreciate um, the fact that, that watches have a certain heritage. And this certainly isn't age-based either, because from what I've, I've been able to find out, Really, watch purchases of a vintage style aren't by any stretch um, set um, and, and fixed with the um, with, uh, with with older individuals. Um, for example, um, in their their fifties, sixties, and seventies, but rather, in fact, a lot of these watches are enjoyed by people in their twenties, thirties, and forties. Um, and in, in case, in many cases, watches which would have been designed before they were born. And what these vintage styled watches do for brands is, in my eyes, it allows them to anchor themselves on a heritage or an idea, a simple set of ideals of producing a high-quality, simple watch that fulfills exactly what you want out of a, a three-hand or a six-hand chronograph watch, without any of the additional complication that we often see in the form of, for example, smartwatches, which certainly have their place, but I don't think um, we will ever replace the watch in the, the traditional sense, because it's not really a... Uh, a piece to be used purely practically, but rather aesthetically, as something that we enjoy wearing, um, that, that we can justify with our, our enjoyment, rather than being a purely technical piece. And this is what they're able to achieve through these vintage timepieces, to show where they've come from, the story of the brand and the, the history of what you're buying into. Just as, for example, when you buy a Rolls-Royce or a Bentley, they sell you an idea, rather than, uh, rather than the idea of, of simply having a, a utility.
My personal opinion on these pieces is that I really do like them, because what they allow you to have is the look of a vintage timepiece, but the glorified look of a vintage timepiece without all the downsides that actually were present back then. So you don't have the non-hacking movements, the non-manual winding movements, the, the, the sheer inaccuracy of vintage movements as well. You're able to get a watch which really is built to modern specifications, which is why I do think the Tudor Black Bay, for example, is a tremendous idea. It's a phenomenal concept, as is the case with the Omega Seamaster 300, um, and likewise uh, various other pieces like the, the new Hoyer Otavia. All of these watches draw on the history, but give you something modern which simply t takes inspiration from something of, of real age and, and history. And so as a result, you're able to enjoy the best of all the worlds, and, and I think this is a fantastic idea. And so as a result, I, I certainly do, do understand this, this increase in the popularity of these vintage-styled watches, and why having aged loom on a watch is actually quite desirable, despite being potentially seen as somewhat uh, fake. But I must say, I think it's a, a very attractive idea of being able to liken the modern watch industry to its past, which I think gives a, a far more, a more easily appreciated history to a watch, without the, um, the, the idea that uh, all modern watches, modern luxury watches, are designed to simply uh, show off as, as status symbols, but rather show a far more emotional connection to a watch for an aesthetic value and an aesthetic beauty from a, a day gone by. Now, I'll conclude this video here, but I really would be very interested to hear your opinions on, on vintage-inspired watches and indeed the trend of enjoying vintage timepieces instead of modern timepieces, because for many collectors, uh, the vintage world is far more interesting than modern watches, and I can certainly understand where they're coming from, though I do like to enjoy both. And so do leave your comments down below as to what you thought of this video, and indeed um, what you thought of my, my, uh, my, my, my points with regards to why these have gained so much popularity. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to, to enjoy more content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.